center. I'm going to start with an overview of the uh, project. Um, you know, this thing's just getting ramped up, so none of this is like super essential. Uh, I'm just going to overview what I'm trying to do. I'll show you existing things. What's going on here? <clears throat> All right, uh, I'm gonna go to the screen. Let's, let me make sure I don't have any thing up I shouldn't have. Not like I do much that shouldn't be shared. That's the nice thing about being a community manager. You can pretty much show whatever you're doing. Uh, so let's look at web. I might, maybe I won't show my emails, but <laughs> uh, I will show you what I'm trying to do. So first of all, let's look at building HTM systems. That is what we're gonna be working on. Here's the website. Um, this is a WordPress site, which I still don't remember exactly why I set it up this way. But at the time I was thinking, I'm just gonna draw or make these little components and attach it to the pros, right? Um, so, my plan was all over here. I was gonna do encoders, walk through all the encoders, and that, stu that stuff was pretty easy. And then go on to spatial pooling. And there's, uh, there's something else that I wanted to show you that I'll get to in just a minute here. Um, Cause I'll show you the visualizations as well as um, like what I, what I got. And you can walk through this and, and look at it. There, they're, they're pretty much simple, but I sort of learned a lot of things from this of what I'm going to go and want to do. Uh, so I'm going to take the lessons that I learned from building this and, and combine it with some other things. So in the spatial pooling section, let's see, I think there's some, I wanted to have a 3D section here, but there's, uh, here's where I was starting to get more of the HTM school style of visualizations. Um, this one in particular, I, I liked quite a bit, but I think I can, I can still iterate on this. this. This represents the distribution of initial permanences. And so you can sort of set how quickly neurons will be connected um, as they start learning uh, based on this sort of Gaussian distribution. And then there's this idea of streaming data, which I'm, we will be taking advantage of. I want to have um, like site, site-wide you know here's the thing i'm not quite sure how i'm going to do this yet am i going to run an htm in everybody's browser or am i going to have an htm that's running on the server that has learned a few things you know and and something that maybe we can inspect so we can have a consistent state of the model there or should we let it run and build up in the server we'll figure that out as we go along anyway um this is all in the GitHub building HTM systems under uh, GitHub community. Pop that in chat too. Um, and so that's what we're gonna be looking at, and, but I've already started tearing it up. Uh, so, there's, so there's already an old source. So let me show you what I'm, what I'm striving for. I'm gonna try and make visualizations like this person makes visualizations because they're so good. <laughs> Maybe we should just go to the line drawing one because it's, it's easy. Um, so this is an interactive visualization of how to draw a line through a grid. And it's also about number interpolation. And, and so he's got these interactive components here that are just really well integrated with the pros, with the, the instruction, the tutorial. This is exactly what I want to do, something like this. And he builds upon visualizations um, and he also has sort of a, it's a really nice aesthetic for all of this stuff. Um, so I want to try and copy him, uh, in, in this. So some other examples, you know, you can change orientations. Then look, see, as you change this, the whole page changes. So this is, and, and you can see there's text changes happening here. Um, this is, wait, this is the kind of stuff 
that I want to do when, when I when you click this you can see that text changing um, I think that's really neat so I want to make uh, our building HTM systems feel like this because this is so nice it's super super cool um, I mean look at that <laughs> that's so cool uh, Anyway, I think we can do this. I think this is a good goal to strive for. And he actually even, I, I think his name is Emil, uh, has a tutorial about making tutorials. Where is that at? Anyway, we'll, we'll get into that. Because um, <clears throat> uh, it's really nice. He shows how to do a diagram. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure it was on here. Is it first half of the line drawing tutorial? Anyway, where is it? I know there's a tutorial about tutorials on here. Uh, it doesn't matter. We'll find it eventually. So, uh, so we're going to try and make that, um, this encoding HTM systems. Where is it here? Like that. And we'll tear it out of WordPress. We're not going to use WordPress. We're just going to create a simple web server, knowing that we may have to run an HTM on it at some point. Maybe, we'll see. Um, okay, let me put on Twitter that I'm live streaming. I always forget to do that. <laughs> so let's do that over here. Oh man, I got a lot of notifications. What did I do? Okay, um, live live coding um building htm systems now all right okay we'll leave it like that i'll come back and check check the tweets later um okay so my 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 vision i'm trying to find this it was in cool who was this uh, so I have like a, a really detailed vision of this, if I can find it in my, I've got it on my, here we go, Notability. I drew it on my iPad and that, and so it, uh, there, no, BHTMS is what I call it. <laughs> um, where is the visual overview? I think this is it. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is the vision. Let's make this a little bigger. Maybe I should just whatever open with docs I don't care how you open it just open it <laughs> I'm opening it two different ways now which one's which one's gonna win okay just we'll cancel that come on open up <laughs> okay holy cow okay so that didn't work hold on <laughs> then uh, then I do want to download it I guess I don't I don't like viewing it in the browser now it is gonna download this one already canceled. It's awful. Okay. So I can scroll through and give you a cur of course it opens it in the browser for me. Um, okay, so uh, I want to, and we're going to talk about spatial pooling, and I think I want to make this visual heavy. These don't have, all have to be interactive visualizations, but coming from a very visual place, this is what I want to try and draw. Like talking about the, a layer of a cortical column as a computational unit like because that's the, I think as far as software that's the, the the link I'm making from HTM to so, you know neuroscience theory to software is using a cortical column as a compute layer and it has a projection of feed forward input and it attempts to represent the input in the sensory layer so that's what we're going to make building HTM systems about initially it was just about Basically, spatial pooling and temporal memory and how it does its thing um, in this layer. Feed forward input space. And then we'll talk about mini columns and all having different receptive fields. Here's the thing. I don't know if these drawings are right. So um, I'm putting that off. I'll, I will uh, have them reviewed for correctness by somebody who knows the neuroscience better than me. Which may be someone on chat. Who knows? But um, the point is, each mini column has, has a different potential pool of connections. And then dive in, and this is where we, at some point, we're going to get to the animated stuff, 
we dive into one mini column and we look at its potential pool. Zoom in and show that it's full of neurons, but um, anyway, so here's the visualization that I'm gonna end up on. And this, is, this is depends on a sort of um, pseudo randomly generated stream. So much like the hot gym stream, something um, that is can be programmatically generated and it's added with a little bit of noise or if you can configure it or whatever. And I want that for, from the spatial pooler on um, to constantly be streaming in the background, you know, to be available, to be updating, to be some observable data source in some way so that all of the diagrams on the screen, I'm gonna start calling them diagrams like Emil and Red Blob. So all the diagrams on the screen um, assuming they will be React components or wrapped in React components or something like that. They're gonna get their data from, from this in the React way, right? So we'll do Redux for storage. And I know, Jeremy, you, you suggested view. I looked into it. It just seems to, I don't know, I'm just gonna use React, a couple of reasons. Main, one, the main one is because it's the big popular one. And I haven't even looked at my Twitter mentions, but it's the most popular one, and I want this to be easily accessible to people. Um, so that's the, that's probably the main reason, because it's been around for a while. Everybody seems to know it. I know a lot of engineers that like it, and I've never used it, and I had some reservations about it. But some people I respect uh, have said to me it's not bad once you get over a few things. So I'm just going to go with that, and I'm not going to argue about it in my mind anymore. But I did I did spend some time working with Vue a little. Um, not Angular though, I didn't even go that route. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna do React and we'll use Redux, I imagine, for the data store thing. I just need an observable data store. Um, every component needs to have a data store and the data store can be changed by anything on the page. You know, I wanna be able to easily hook it up to a user interface so that users can change data in the store on all the widgets should update. Um, when that happens. So much like you just saw on the red blob page where the grids updated. Um, so anyway, I'm going to show basically this is going to be the input for the spatial pooler, a stream of data over time. And, and so here would be basically a, a scalar encoder view. And right here would show this is a scalar encoder of bits for that. And we might we could use an RDSE, but let's not. Let's just make it simple. So we'll just use a normal scalar encoder here. And then we'll have time encoding, and it's represented as cyclic encoders showing time. So this is all going to be dynamically changing. Tick, 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 tick. All these encoders are going to be changing as we, as we move along. Um, so, right. Um, so, yeah. So like I said, this, uh, this data essentially emits every for every streaming that follows, okay? So here's a visualization. This is gonna, again gonna be, um, it has its own page. I'll, I will, or I was planning on making it have its own page. Where did it go? A combined encoding. So this will sort of be one of the next encodings that we're gonna work on in this series. Um, and so we'll take a time encoding essentially and color them in different ways and, and put them all in the same, the same grid so you can see there will be two states of it and you just flip it on and off. So that's that's one of the components that shows combining or a multi-encoder, if you will. And then we're gonna talk about potential pools. So again, this is heavy on the HTM school. You know, uh, uh, this is what I, really close to what I did in HTM school. But we're gonna talk about one mini column, right? Just, we're gonna focus on one mini column. And so we'll, you know, show a potential pool for just one mini column and then overlay some feed forward input on top of the potential pool and, and basically have this interactive so that the user can move through the spatial pool or mini columns and select a different mini column, see its potential pool and the current feed forward input that's overlapping with it, and also see um, what input it observed versus ignored. Right? Yeah, because they were outside of its potential pool, something like that. And this would be continuously updating, tick, 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 tick. So there's got to be a pause, right? Sort of like a global pause button somewhere, because you can imagine someone saying, wait, 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 let's stop this and look through the whole spatial pooler, right? And say, at one time step, what, is, what do these potential pools look like? 
and then step forward, what, what changes when I step forward? Oh, only the feed forward input changes, the potential pools don't change, All right? So I want people to be able to explore um, these structures. So um, that's the idea for potential pools. And um, so uh, how, how were the 3D visualizations done? And oh, those were all WebGL. Uh, what did I use? I forgot. They, they were, there's a, it's called Selviz. There's a GitHub repository called Selviz that does that. And it's, it has logic that translates layers of neurons into Cartesian coordinates. Um, it's currently now in a new project called Highbrow. I pulled all that logic. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Because <laughs> I do think we can embed um, uh, some some of those visualizations. Why not? We might as well. Uh, so anyway, there's one about, there's one. Hey, MPJ, nice to see you. Thank you. Um, and he's hosting my stream. That's amazing. I appreciate that. So, so the next thing we're going to do is called receptive fields. And this is like, potential it's it's a receptive field this is sort of a terminology that we've invented okay it, because the terminology in the neuroscience is so whacked out like there's a lot of different terms for things the potential pool we're going to say in htm anyway doesn't change a mini column has a potential pool from the beginning of time and it does not change its receptive field can change over time it learns its receptive field within the bounds of a potential pool the receptive field is like how permanent are those connections? So it includes not only the the, the, the potential uh, pool, but all the different connection strengths or per, synapse permanence values there. And if you apply a threshold to that, you've got which ones are connected and which ones are not connected. So so I want to show that the sort of another dimension on top of the potential pools is this idea of connection strength, and we'll call that a receptive field. And if you put a threshold on that connection strength, um, you can decide what uh, what are connected, what synapses are connected, and what are not. Um, so that'll be, again, the same, all of these, again, are, have this streaming data source in the background that you can pause and, and play um, on top. Um, and so then we're going to talk about the initial permanences. So I showed you sort of a visual of that. So we're going to be using that with a little bit of a modified version of that. Um, but, we're, but we are, this is where we sort of introduce these ideas of thresholds too. So um, there's, there's going to be two important thresholds on, on this page, especially particularly about the, the spatial pooler. It's the connection threshold, which is you know, what we we're just talking about here, the receptive field connection threshold. How strong do the permanence have to be? Permanences have to be before I decide that it is connected or not, because that's the binary activation there. You know, that's where we turn the scalar into binaries or it's by using these thresh thresholds. And then there's another threshold later on that's also important. Um, <clears throat> but at some point, I want to show a place where you can slide both the thresholds and see how it affects cell states, you know. Um, so, you know, again, being very visual with this, I, uh, we're trying to recenter people and, and remember, we're just talking about one mini column, you know, this is because that's always that that's something that always got to me when I, I kept thinking that I was looking at something that applied to anyway. Um, every mini column has a potential pool and receptive field. And then we talk about inhibition. So I, I'm, I might not even use the term inhibition in this except for in the pros, but what I like to call this and what makes more sense to me is a mini column competition. Now, neuro, neurologically, neuroscience wise, inhibition is causing this competition. So you've got pyramidal neurons, which are excitatory neurons and then in, inhibitive neurons. Um, and, and those are like keeping them from firing, but they have this control over whether some neurons fire or not. Um, so we've boiled this down in the spatial pooling idea that we see. This is basically what we think inhibition is doing, okay? It's causing this competition of mini columns. Um, so again, we're gonna show the, this feed forward input um, and it's gonna be a combined encoding of the whole input space. So all of the date uh, semantics and a scalar semantic. And now at this point, th this is the first visualization that we're actually going to have to run a spatial pooler for. <laughs> so up until this point, we don't even have to really run HTM yet. It's basically just encodings and, and a few formulas, you know. <clears throat> um, so here we're going to have to run a spatial pooler. 
and we're gonna have to inspect it at each time step. So, so at this point is where we start bottlenecking because um, the spatial pooler has a lot of state. Um, for every mini column that it has, it, it has n number of connections, you know, and uh, to the input space. So, you know, it's the number of mini columns essentially times the number, the amount of bits in the input space. Um, that's what you could you potentially display. So, but we'll focus on one mini column at a time. And so we have to make whatever way that we get the state from the, from the spatial pooler, where however we get the cells, we need to make sure it's efficient one mini column at a time, right? So there's just things we need to think about as we start to build out the structure is I'm doing this to create these visualizations and I feel like creating the code to support the visualizations will make the code make more sense, right? So this is not gonna be efficient spatial pooling code. This is gonna be probably pretty inefficient, but it'll make the most sense to whoever is looking at the visualizations here. Um, okay, so, so this chart is for each, uh, let's see. Oh, so this is actually not for each mini column now. This is looking at all across the mini columns. So we're highlighting um, the mini columns by their uh, overlap. Okay, so the, all the green mini columns have a high amount of overlap. Uh, this is after we've already done the binary calculation. So this is how many bits are on essentially in each receptive or potential pool. Um, and uh, so we'll highlight the mini columns that are winning the competition and sort of show um, this is the neighborhood, right? And these are, these are the mini columns that win in this neighborhood and we're talking about a global neighborhood. I will not talk about local inhibition at all in this pass. Local inhibition, like I might, I might wave a hand to it. You know, we might make, make a note, side note, inhibition, global versus local or something like that. But we will not explain it at this point because I think it's too complicated to introduce at this point. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, it was too, I didn't learn, I didn't understand local inhibition until I understood global inhibition. I mean, I think that's, I think it makes sense to, to glaze over it right now. Okay, and this also introduces this other threshold that's super important, the overlap threshold. And this decides how many mini columns are we gonna have active. So you can do this in different ways. You can decide how many mini columns do you want active um, and then pick the overlap threshold that gives you that essentially. Um, or, uh, well, or you, you can apply basically, so essentially you apply K winners. You, you just say, I want this many, mini columns, you stack rank them on overlap and then you just draw a line and say, these are all my winners, period. Um, but I, I will, I can also show you how you can use this overlap threshold to decide who wins or not, but then I, you won't get, you know, a specific number of winners. So we'll, we'll deal with that when we get there about, and talk about tie breaking, we'll probably have to talk about tie breaking. If we're going to make a spatial pooler, we'll have to write some tie breaking code, right? Um, okay. So we'll get to that. And now the, so this whole, this is the same visualization and I'm, now I'm just talking about mouse interaction. So this is going to be a very interactive display. Um, overlap threshold is global inhibition mechanism. E e yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You, so that or the K winners, the K is, but, but you could apply this within neighborhoods. Like you, I could break this up and say, okay, these six mini columns are all going to pete against each other. And these are all going to pete against each other. So you could, and you could say, I'm only going to have one win in each group. So you could sort of distribute it like that. That's, that's.